you can throw the right color, speed, and profile. But if your lure doesn't put out the right sound and vibration, a bass might not even know it's there. Or worse, get spooked by it. A new study helps crack the code. I'll break down what's really going on, how fish actually find your lure, and which baits pull them in. So we all know bass can hear underwater, but how well they can sense direction and actually locate things underwater, that's more of a mystery. So this new study leads me to believe there are definitely some lures they can sense and find a lot better than others, but the ones on the list, I'm guessing some of them might surprise you. So let me break down the study for you, and then I'll get into some recommendations on what lures to use and when to put the odds in your favor. So this groundbreaking study, it was published in June of 2024 in the journal Nature. It's peer-reviewed and was done by German scientists at the Einstein Center for Neurosciences. So scientists have known for a long time that some fish species can tell direction underwater of sounds. You know, as humans, we can easily do this. If a gunshot goes off over there or you hear fireworks over here, you can tell the direction. So there's two ways as humans that we do this. One, the volume is different. If it's from this side, it'll be louder in this ear than it is in this ear. And then also there's a time difference. The time that it takes to get to this ear versus the other ear that's how our brain figures it out where the direction is. Now for fish, it's a lot more challenging and that's why they have trouble figuring out how they do it. For starters, underwater sound travels over four times faster. So it's very rapidly getting there. So telling that difference between the two ears, that's gonna be a really, really, really small difference. And here's the other thing. You know, we can tell the, the loudness difference because our head basically blocks the sound wave, so it's more quiet on the on the other side where it's not coming from. Well, sound waves in water, the fish body itself allows waves to pass through. It doesn't reflect it or stop it like our human head does. So underwater, those sound waves are actually traveling through the fish pretty effectively. So they don't necessarily tell a volume difference either. So there's not much time difference, not much volume difference. They're not sure how they do it. So there are two main ways that fish hear. And the first is with particle motion, and they can actually, with their ears, they have ears like us, and they actually detect the motion, the faint little motion of water molecules underwater. Now with this one, they can actually tell direction somewhat, but they can only say if it's somewhat left or somewhat right, they really can't pinpoint. They don't know if it's more towards the front, more towards their tail. So that's not, you can't really pinpoint with that. And then the second one is actually through pressure. It's pressure waves underwater, and they have a swim bladder. That's what that basically floats them. It, it allows, it adjusts as they go shallower and deeper. That swim bladder, it feels the vibration of those pressure waves underwater. Now you probably point out that bass, they also have a lateral line. The thing is that only for most fish, that's only within a few body lengths of the actual fish. They're not typically or understood to feel stuff that's four miles away or 100 feet out. That's more of a close range thing. And actually in this experiment, what they did is chemically uh, disabled the lateral line and took that out of the equation, pretty much showed they were not using the lateral line. It was these other, either their ear or the swim bladder that felt the pressure that was figuring out where they figured out the direction was. So the fish they chose to test this on was pretty similar to a lot of other fish in its hearing with the swim bladder and with the ears. It's called a Danianella cerebrum. I think I'm getting that right. But it's a tiny, 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 tiny fish. And it's also very transparent. So the fact that it's so tiny, obviously the distance from one ear to the other, that's gonna be super tiny. And then the fact that it's transparent, they could do imaging and actually see the internal structures of the fish and actually see you know, what's going on when they actually put sound waves in the water. So to start this experiment, they put those fish in tanks and then they had speakers on different sides and they tested them. And when the speaker would go off with this loud sound on one side or the other, the fish would startle and they almost always got it right 80% of the time if the sound was coming from the right, they would startle away from it. If it's on the left, they would startle away to the other side. So they pretty much could sense where the direction was. So at this point, then they wanted to isolate and figure out if it was the pressure or that particle motion, which element of sound was making the fish startle and have direction. So what they did is they isolated the sound. They did the, the particle motion only, or they did the pressure only. And when they did that, either one would still make the fish startle. You know, they would jump, but they, if they didn't know which direction it was from. They could sense it, they could hear it, but it spooked them, they didn't know where to go. So at this point, they started playing a trick on the fish. They put additional speakers in there, and what they did is they still played 
the particle motion sound, but then they would selectively invert the pressure component, basically getting them out of phase. And what they noticed then is when they weren't in phase, when they weren't in alignment, they could actually make the fish move towards the speaker that was making the startling sound instead of away from it. So based on the reaction to that trick and changing the phase, it showed that they were actually comparing the particle motion and the pressure and comparing the phase between the two. A pretty complex uh, computation, but they were taking all that into account and then based on the phase difference, they could pinpoint the direction. So in the fish science community, this was a huge breakthrough. The fact that there were a number of different theories that they had tested over the years and it was hard to control all these variables. This is a major breakthrough in research, understanding how fish actually can figure out direction. Now, when we apply this to bass though, there's something important to keep in mind. Now, the minnows used in this have, they're part of a type of fish, they're more classified as hearing specialists. And you put uh, catfish are in there, carp are in there, a lot of minnows, and they actually, with their swim bladder and then their ears, there's actually a, a bony structure that connects them. So they have a pretty uh, connected link there that helps them sense in their swim bladder and communicate to, that to their ears. Now with the bass, bass don't have this. It's a, they're what's called hearing generalist. They don't have as big a range of hearing. They're not as uh, tuned in. It's not one of their primary you know, sensory sources as much as some other fish. So they can still sense through their swim bladder, but since they don't have this bony structure, those vibrations in their swim bladder have to go through body tissue to get to their ears. There's no direct you know, it's like being hardwired to it versus the old uh, old time telephone on a wire or something. It's a lot slower and not as uh, crisp and clear as what these specialized fish have. Now this wasn't directly in the research, but there are other species that aren't necessarily uh, specialists that have been shown to have directional capabilities. And like the, the cod, there's a cod study. Uh, basically what they, they would classify this as is Bass probably have more of a coarse uh, sense of direction where they can get a somewhat general direction, but it's not pinpoint or laser focused. These carp, catfish and stuff, when they hear a sound over there, it's like us with a gunshot or something, your eyes go right to it, it's like boom, it's right there. And they might even be able to tell the, the distance. Whereas bass, it's kind of like the boom goes off and they turn and say, start looking around like, hmm, something went off over there. Or hmm, sounds like, something to eat over there. So they know the general direction, maybe within like 20 degrees. It's not laser focused, but it's de definitely, if something's gonna have the right frequency and it's gonna be loud enough, they're gonna be able to sense it. Now, bass are more tuned to low frequencies and about 100 hertz, basically lo really low frequencies, that's what they they're specialize in. That's the best sound they pick up. Now, just to be clear on this, so from a distance, bass can probably still hear sounds that a lot of times they aren't able to directly locate. They're hearing something that's at a, a frequency or not strong enough. They're not feeling it in their swim bladder enough to really know where, exactly where it's at. Like I'm hearing a hum of a trolling motor or I'm hearing a lipless crankbait, but I, I just don't know where it's at. Versus ones that are in a low frequency that's loud enough that stimulates that uh, air bladder where they can actually feel it, then they're gonna be able to home in on it more. So that's what we're talking about. Actually telling, they can still hear it, but this is getting the direction. So what type of lures are gonna do it? And it's gonna break into two categories. Ones that basically put out a loud sound at low frequency, and then other ones that put out a big thump that are gonna move a lot of water, those ones are gonna be the pressure waves where they're gonna be able to feel that as well. So let's talk about the first ones. These easily come to mind. A lot of these are the thumpers and the clackers. And so high-pitched rattles, you know, a lot of BBs or something, that's gonna be high-pitched, not so much. One knockers, single rattles, something that's a thunk, 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 thunk. Those type rattles, that's gonna be a low frequency. That's something that's gonna, they're gonna more likely pick up. Now, other thunks like that, if you have bladed jigs, are a very classic one, that blade's going back and forth on that head, just tick, 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 tick. You can hear that in the water. Low frequency, that's thumping over and over. Stuff like uh, headbanger buzz baits, you know, where the buzz bait goes around and hits the head repeatedly, that's another thump or two. So something like that where you're actually getting that mechanical noise and it's thumping at a low frequency, 
that's something that a bass is going to be able to pick up at that low frequency. So the other category are baits that are have that low frequency pressure. So you think of a Colorado blade uh, spinner bait. Now that one, you know, that old thump that you feel, it's not making a, a thump sound like a, a one knocker, like click, click, click. That's the thump that you feel though. That thing's displacing water. That's the classic bait that guys have used for years. So a big Colorado blade. Now another one that's very popular, worked for a long time, are traditional wide wobbling crankbaits. You think of the narrow run ones, lipless crankbaits is that tight wiggle. The classic ones, you know, like your DD-22s and your, your dimes and all these more wide wobbling ones, they're gonna roll more. And when they're rolling like that, those, those push a lot of water. Again, that's putting out, it's not that mechanical noise, not hearing click, 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 but it's pushing water. Now, baits can have a combination, something like those wide wobbling crankbaits, and then you put a, a single thunking rattle in there, then you're getting that noise, the rattle. You're also getting the crankbait pushing water on both sides. That's starting to put out a lot of noise at that low frequency. Probably one of the reasons why those crankbaits, all the ones that have dominated a lot of the summertime tournaments, those just pushing the water and thunking going along the bottom, great way to call in fish, seem to work. So let's get into when you want to go with one style versus the other, but let's start by figuring out, okay, so bass aren't as optimized for this, so they're probably not hearing it 300 feet away, half mile away, and saying, oh, there's the, your bait over there, I'm going to go run two at a half mile away. Maybe it's 10 feet, maybe it's 30 feet, maybe it's 100 feet, I don't know what the exact uh, distance is. But then go back and remember that lateral lines, you're only talking a few body lengths away. So lateral lines are great at real close range, but they're not gonna be able to pick out where something's at. In clear water, bass is very much a visual predator. That's probably their number one sense. That's what they're gonna use to determine if they bite or not, what draws them in at the end once they get up close and they can see it and say, oh, that's food or oh, that looks cool. I'm gonna go check it out. The thing is, when they can't see necessarily super far, then attracting them to your bait, like say muddy water, if if that uh, calling power is only a few more feet, you know, if lateral line's only a few feet away, if you can draw them from six feet, eight feet, 15 feet, 30 feet, I mean, that's a big advantage. They can't see in that mud. They can't, uh, their lateral line's not close enough. If it's, a, if it's a lure that they can actually sense where it's at, when it's a low vis environment, that's gonna be a big help to get them actually over to your bait instead of having to put it right past their nose to be able to catch them. So that leads me to when do you wanna to try to use those calling categories, those ones with the live, low frequency, more attracting power versus the ones that are more silent and uh, harder for them to pick up. I think you wanna use these, these thumpers and water pushers, the, the more aggressive baits, the calling baits, like we just said there, in muddy water, where they can't see very far, uh, you know, unless they're really spooky, which they usually aren't in mud, the, the main trick is actually get them to see your bait. You know, if, if they can't get near it, they're never gonna strike it. They can't see very far in mud, they're not gonna swim way out off a point, or if they're in a lay down, they're not gonna come out 10 feet to get it. Going down the bank, you're almost gonna have to hit him in the head. If you have this, not only are they aware that it's out there, but they're also gonna be if they're active, coming to it. So I would say in muddy water, going with these low frequency baits, uh, I think that's definitely gonna put the odds in your favor. Now, a couple more scenarios that I really wanna use this. When the fish are active, when they're on the seek and they'll bite, you know, front's coming, it's just one of those days pre-spawn where it's warming up, they're really active. That's where I wanna use these as well. It's like, I want every fish there knowing that the bait's there, so they're gonna come to it and attack it. And then another time is when I'm covering water. If I'm not going slowly, I don't have really a, a real, there's tons of cover, it's a huge grass bed, or I'm just trying to check an area to see if there's fish in there, and I'm not making precise cast every five feet, but I'm making a cast maybe every 60 or 100 feet, and I'm just flying down the bank or just at a pond, and I'm checking it out, and I'm walking around it really fast, and I just want to see what kind of fish live here, what size, and I'm making one cast, move 100 feet, another cast. In that case, you're trying to draw fish to your bait. That's where this loud, low frequency, the water push and the sound is gonna help draw them to it and it's gonna alert those fish, hey, there's something there where they can figure it out and come to it. So I'm definitely gonna use them in those cases. Now let's talk about the flip side where maybe this isn't working for you. And also remember, we're not sure how far out they can actually get, actually figure out exactly where something's at. 
So they're probably going to be able to hear it before they can tell exactly where it's at. Now, if fish are kind of spooky and pressured, you know, when they start hearing that bait, even if they don't know where it's from, if, you know, if they're aggressive or they're active and feeding, hearing that, that noise from a distance, uh, you know, that's a good thing because they're, even if they don't know exactly where it's at, they're kind of on the look and saying, huh, you know, I, I want to go check this out. Uh, at the same time, if they're spooky, you know, that puts them on their guard. If they can hear it 100 feet away, but they don't really know where it's at until 20 feet away, well, that's 80 feet most of your retrieve where they're already putting their sense up like, oh, man, something's coming for me. Like, oh, I, I know to shut down versus if it's more silent, it kind of sneaks up on them. They don't really hear it. They don't really sense it until it's right there. And then it's more of a reaction bite where he either decides he wants it or not versus you gave him forward, forward to 10 seconds to figure out that, oh, God, here comes one of those lure things again with the hook. You know, they're already over it by the time it gets there. So not always is sound uh, in your favor. Sometimes it's alerting them way too soon. Now, another scenario, like I said, we don't know how far they can hear and how far they can hear directionally. If they're relating to cover and they come towards the bait, well, that's not necessarily always a good thing. Think about swim baits, those big swim baits, the drawing power of them. Man, they can catch a fish, but what's the big critique of them? What's the downside? Well, if you throw it to a lay down or a point, and it, the point's right here, the lay down's here, you throw that swim bait, it goes by it, and then all those fish that were on that, that, that spot, they all leave and they follow the, the bait, they follow back to the boat. You pull them off there, they'll eat when they're on the point, but all of a sudden they, they left now and they're all scattered out. You get one cast across there, you pulled them all off, you basically wrecked the school, you have to come back in an hour. Well, it could be the same thing with sound. You know, if you have a really loud one in muddy water that's really putting out a lot of sound and fish are kind of aggressive and it's pulling them off towards it a long ways, well, if they're around a stump, say, uh, you could start drawing them out where they're, you know, they're, they hear something, they're coming to it. Well, they're not actually around the stumps. It's better if you have something more silent and you come right to the stump when the bass is sitting right by the stump, you can get them to bite. Versus if you're pulling them 10, 15 feet off it, and, and he's not going to bite when he's off the stump, you might be pulling him away, or you may be, if you're deep cranking, or you're fishing like a, a schooling spot where there's a whole group of fish, or they're all underneath the boat dock, and you have them grouped up around a brush pile on the boat dock, well, that sound may be pulling them out. They're all coming out back towards the boat instead of staying where you can actually catch them. So in that case, pulling them away, not good. And then, like I said before, with pressured fish, ones that are beat up, you know, a lot of times, I think, less is more with them going more subtle uh even soft plastics and stuff creature baits and and 10 inch worms with that ribbon tail that's still putting out pressure waves that's a more natural uh signature and profile of a bait versus these mechanical ones that we use so you know you, you might want to ne not necessarily use them then and then if it's in clear water like you probably don't have to call them to it by the by the sound the clearer it is the more they're going to study it uh, I think it needs to be more natural. You don't need an advantage unless they're really active. You know, you, you can pull them in from a long ways. But otherwise, uh, it seems like a lot of times in clear water that they're more visual. So the sound might just be one more negative cue, unnatural cue versus giving them something positive. You know, there's tons of variables with fishing lures. And the Navy actually did a study on what attracted sharks to sailors in the water, and they figured out what drew them in, and that applies to bass as well. So check out this video. If you want to know what lures look like under the water to bass, spoiler alert, not the same as us, check this one out. Plus I have my full science playlist, more studies talking about the natural world and understanding bass just a little bit better.